welcome uh, to um, the uh, another episode of the uh, Pandemic Perspectives Autumn Lecture Series. I'm delighted uh, to have with us uh, two of a team of three from Birmingham City University, uh, 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 Mark, uh, uh, Mark McGlashan uh, and uh, uh, Matt Gee. Um, uh, both of them are doing, uh, delivering this really interesting talk, uh, which relates to, and I'll just essentially read out the information we've given, uh, that they point out that the COVID crisis required mass communication and public understanding on a massive scale. Uh, and, and clearly this led to a proliferation of online discussion, new sharing and the emergence of, and in inverted commas, information so uh, sources, um, raising concerns uh, about potential dangers of disinformation, which I think we'll all be familiar with. Uh, and they've addressed this and tackled this, uh, um, noting, by the way, a lack of input from linguistic experts, which we have with us today. And they have an, analyzed it using corpus linguistic methods. Uh, um, and the aim of the, the process is to investigate the clarity and reception of official messaging and trustworthiness of online information sources. Um, couldn't be more apt. Delighted to have you. Um, over to you. Okay, so um, so yep. Yeah, so this is a presentation about the project Track COVID, Trust and Communication, a Coronavirus Online Visual Dashboard. Um, I'm Matt G. I'm here with Mark. Um, the PI of the project was Andrew, and we worked on this with other colleagues. Um, we're all we all work in linguistics at Birmingham City University. Um, and uh, more precisely, we do a lot of work in corpus linguistics, which I'll try to explain as we go along. And the project was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So the object objectives of the project were to develop a corpus of UK tweets covering the COVID-19 crisis. So by a corpus, we mean a large collection of tweets, a database of tweets, a large collection of text and then make this available through a open access online dashboard through which um, trends in word use, frequently shared web links and the propagation through sort of social networks and over time can be explored. And then use this uh, data and the tool to, um, to explore two areas in two case studies. So one is about um, the communication um, by the government and the government messaging and the other one is the trustworthiness of sources online being shared through Twitter. So why did we use Twitter? Well, um, firstly, firstly because of availability. I mean, the Twitter API is um, a, a great resource for accessing large amounts of data from the history of Twitter back to 2006, using the, uh, the, the various endpoints of the API. It's extremely valuable. Um, we also have experience of um, ling linguistic um, analyzed corpora of tweets and previous projects. It's diachronic, so um, we've got clear dates for all of the tweets, so we can easily study changes across time during the pandemic. It's an official channel used by governments and public bodies to disseminate information, but at the same time, it also allows um, public figures and citizens to share information. Uh, and it's also been identified as a key vector in the spread of misinformation and conspiracy theories. And so um, we use Twitter to build a corpus of UK tweets relating to COVID-19. We use the historical power track API from that. So Twitter provides uh, lots of, well, a, a few different APIs through which you can access tweets in a, a computational way and process them. And historical power track was one of those and that enabled us to access history um, going back um, several months. Um, so the, the period that the corpus covers is the 1st of January 2020 to the 30th of April 2021. Um, and it ends at that point because that's the point at which the project ended. Um, the tweets that we collected had to be in English language. They had to be posted from the UK or by a user with a UK profile and they must contain COVID or coronavirus or frequent COVID related hashtags. So using um, the historical power track resource with those, um, with those search terms and restrictions, we were able to collect 84 million tweets 
um, which covered 2.1 million user accounts. And this is the distribution of those tweets over time. So we can see that there's a big increase in the number of tweets happening in the middle of March 2020, um, which of course was when the pandemic was really sort of um, taking hold in the UK and the first lockdown was happening. And then it gradually declines and we can see some more um, increases in tweets around the times of other um, lockdowns and outbreaks. And um, we can also see the distribution of retweets, quote tweets and replies in that data. And then I also mentioned that, uh, you know, with this data, we also wanted to create a dashboard so that others could interrogate the data. Um, um, you know, especially, um, and we wanted that dashboard to be a user-friendly interface for non-specialists. Um, and so the dashboard that we created, it uses corpus linguistic methods to find patterns and trends in our COVID corpus. And I'm just going to switch to the browser and show you that now. Okay, so this is the track COVID dashboard. And what we have here first here are the most frequent words in our corpus. So amongst those 84 million tweets, these are the words that are occurring in the most tweets. So we've got people, UK, new, get, us, one, government. We also have the most frequent hashtags being used in that corpus, lockdown, NHS, stay safe, pandemic, COVID idiots and the most frequent websites that are being linked to in those tweets. So they've got links to news sources, links to YouTube, to Government UK, to Change UK, and to NHS.UK. And then another feature we have here is keywords, which is something that we use in Corpus Linguistics quite often. And the idea behind keywords is that we um, compare the frequency of the words in our corpus against their frequency in a random sample of Twitter. So we're trying to find which words are occur occurring more in our COVID specific corpus compared to how frequently you would expect them to occur um, by sort of across the entirety of Twitter. And so the kind of words that we get sort of show the topics of our corpus. So we've got pandemic, lockdown, vaccine, virus, restrictions, deaths, outbreak. Um, and I'll also just point out that we're excluding retweets in these um, figures here and those sort of options are available as well. Now, if I choose vaccine, I'll then be able to see more information about vaccine. So, for example, I can see the frequency of vaccine in our corpus over time. And we see this peak here where vaccines are mentioned highly frequently is at the beginning of November 2020. And we've added a timeline feature to this so you can see some of the events happening at the same time. We look at this peak here, we can see that this peak is happening at the same time the first Pfizer vaccine was approved. And then if we look at this peak here, we can see it's happening when the first person was vaccinated. Um, so it can sort of plot the, the progression of uh, the frequency of a word throughout the corpus. And we can also look at the context within which the words are occurring in. So this view is showing us the words that are occurring in the same tweets as vaccine. Um, and these sort of two views here are designed to be a sort of clean um, view of this for non-specialists. And then there's a, a view lower down, which has more detail in it. So on the left, we've simply got the order of the words. So the most frequently for the word that's occurring most frequently with vaccine is people. And then here we've got this sort of view where um, the closer a word is to vaccine, that indicates that it's used more frequently in tweets with vaccine. Um, all of these are used frequently in tweets with vaccine in this case. But again, it sort of shows the sort of topics that have been talked about around vaccine. So they're talking about um, doses, whether they're safe, whether they're effective, talking about risks. And that sort of enables you to see um, the kind of things that are being discussed um, around vaccines in this corpus. And then lower down, we've got a view where we can go into a bit more detail and we have the frequency information. So again, here we've got words occurring in the same tweets as vaccine. And we can also perhaps uh, choose one of those words like health. And we can see the kind of 
um, phrases that has been used in so public health, health minister, health secretary, health workers, health care, and go one step further and say, okay, so healthcare workers has been discussed and uh, frontline healthcare and healthcare professionals in the healthcare system. And so, um, yeah, and, and use these tools to explore corpus. Similarly, um, hashtags used in the same tweets as vaccine, in this case, COVID vaccine, NHS, AstraZeneca vaccines. Uh, the websites that have been linked to in the tweets containing vaccines. So again, we've got those news websites. We've also got the NHS. It's possible to filter through and see which NHS web pages have been shared. Um, and then some information about um, how many of the tweets are replies or quote tweets and how many users are posting tweets containing vaccine and the distribution of those. In this case, this is a fairly even distribution across um, the users who are tweeting vaccine. Okay. Um, and then also just to say that this data is searchable here as well. So if I want to search for a mask, for example, I can see hashtags that contain mask, like wear a mask, masks, face masks, mask up, wear a damn mask. Um, so this is the kind of data and methods that we're using to explore this large data set. Um, and then I will um, show you some of the results from the uh, first of the case studies. So the first case study was about the public reception of government, um, of the government management of the pandemic, um, and also about the content of the, the tweets that the government was putting out during the pandemic. Um, so, so we looked at the linguistic features, um, the things that I just showed you, most frequent words, keywords, hashtags. Um, we were looking at concepts that stand out in the data, like COVID idiots. Um, things relating to health and safety measures like masks and uh, hashtags that specifically sort of repeat the, the government slogans and messaging. So if we look at those that reflect the government campaigns, we can see the uh, that, um, stay home, save lives, stay home, stay at home, hands face space, stay safe, stay alert, protect the NHS, all being used frequently in our corpus. And then looking at the words and hashtags that they co-occur with, we can see that they have a link to requests and appreciation. So they're co-occurring with please, reminder, help, follow, save, protect, me, thank, everyone most important, and hashtags about the NHS. Um, and so we can sort of, we can see that there's uh, support for COVID related health and safety measures through the frequency with which these are being shared in the context. Um, and we can also see when they're occurring. So the stay at home hashtag is being used more during the first lockdown. And then, of course, it's used less frequently in the subsequent lockdowns where um, the, the focus changed for the government campaigns. Um, so um, looking at uh, COVID and its variants, which again were highly frequent in our corpus, um, we can see the sort of criticism of non-compliance um, is what's occurring um, in the context of, of those hashtags. Um, so, um, so COVID yet sort of co-occur with words and hashtags that signal general dissatisfaction, uh, like fault blame, idiot, selfish, stupid, second wave wear, a damn mask, or those that signal support for the safety measures. So stay at home, safe lives, lockdown, UK lockdown, social distancing, wear a mask. Um, co-occurs with um, hashtags about gatherings, um, in which case the gatherings have been criticised, so Walmart Beach, Trafalgar Square, Hyde Park, and also co-occurs with some hashtags which indicated dissatisfaction with politics, such as the names of politicians, and hashtags like Tory shambles, Tories out, Boris out. So um, we can see that there's this criticism of non-compliance across the corpus, um, and also these hashtags revealed some disapproval of the government approaches to containing the outbreaks. And we can also see that the COVID yet hashtags are used fairly consistently across the pandemic uh, with some peaks around lockdowns and uh, changes in government focus. Okay. 
And then if we look at hashtags that include lockdown, we can see that it gets used in what are called these semantically loaded hashtags. So in for support for lockdown, we see hashtags like lockdown now, lockdown extension, keep the lockdown. And in opposition to it, they're less frequent, but we see hashtags of, um, like anti-lockdown, end the lockdown, lockdown end. And um, the co-occurrence are, are um, with these, um, with the lockdown hashtags um, does change um, across the, the pandemic. So during the three lockdowns, which we've labeled here as L1, L2 and L3, we can see that the criticism of non-compliance is present across all of the lockdowns. We can see that the support for stricter measures also has a presence across all three lockdowns, but the emerging opposition emerges mostly in lockdown two and lockdown three. So overall, there is support for the stricter measures, for the lockdown measures, and there is criticism and non-compliance, which is stronger than the opposition. But there's also this increasing polarization of opinions as the uh, pandemic progresses. Yep, so just to conclude that part of the first case study, that we see that there's strong support for safety measures, including the need for stronger measures. We see that there's this widespread criticism of non-compliance. Um, and we also see that these views associated with COVID deniers are in the minority, but there's this increasing polarization of public opinion. And I mentioned before that another part of this first case study was to look at the government messages themselves and, um, and look at how they are communicating on Twitter. So, so we created a subcorpus of tweets that were specifically from government accounts or from UK health bodies, um, and then looked specifically at um, the content of uh, tweets from those accounts. So for example, taking 10 Downing Street, um, we can see that they often link to external content, um, such as live press, conference, press conferences. They often report on figures and they often make announcements like the government's action plan to tackle the spread of coronavirus. Um, but, they, but we also see some issues with their messages. Um, they might lack specific content and the content is not always clearly framed or easily comprehensible. So for example, um, if we take this tweet here, we appreciate all the effort people are putting into containing the spread of coronavirus However, if you leave your home or gather in public for any reason other than those specified, the police have the powers to disperse you and issue fines. And some of the issues that we can pick up from this, from a linguistic perspective, is that there's no clearly defined function. First of all, the tweet praises and then it warns. There's no clear audience. Is it directed at those who make the effort or is it directed at those who are leaving home for the reasons not allowed? It shifts confusingly from a generic plural people to a singular you. It uses some complex vocabulary, like containing powers, disperse, issue, and complex grammar, like multiple embedded phrases and conditions, if you leave your home, any reason other than those specified. It has apparent specificity, um, where it says for any reason other than those specified, but it doesn't actually specify what those reasons are. Um, and so in general, the sort of poorly constructed messages fail to maximize the advantages of social media in creating that meaningful engagement with the, the followers um, and the author authoritarian institutional voice can create boundaries for non-native speakers or people with learning communication difficulties or lower literacy levels. Uh, we can look at another example, which is an improvement, but still has some issues. So, for example, um, from uh, DHSC Gov UK, you can help slow the spread of coronavirus and save lives. You must stay at home, only leave the house for essentials like food and medicine, or work or to exercise, and stay at home, save lives. So, um, uh, the things that the tweet does well is it, uh, the capitalization of you is drawing attention to the addressee and it draws on the individual sense of responsibility. You can, you must. It provides reasons for leaving the house, food as medicine, 
work exercise. Although you can you can also um, sort of see issues in that because is that list meant to be indicative or um, or complete? Um, and what is essential might differ um, for for one person to another. Um, it includes a, a reference to a specific type of abode, a house, as opposed to a more general home. And in connection with sort of issues of poor access to green spaces um, and issues with the health inequalities that that can create during the pandemic, this type of framing um, could exclude some people from um, some from sort of engaging with this message, leading to a form of active or passive non-compliance. And so in general, careful attention to language use and the community of purpose of the message um, can help build rapport with the wider community and encourage public compliance. So two other good examples um, from our corpus, uh, from the NI executive, help prevent the spread of coronavirus, hashtag COVID-19, stay at home, wash your hands well and often, keep your distance two meters six foot. So this is using short phrases and sentences. It's giving specific steps to follow. It's got the necessary amount of detail. The purpose of the message is clear and the content is coherent. And then one from the Welsh government. Thank you for everyone to continue to play your part in reducing the spread of coronavirus by staying home this weekend. We know it's tough and we appreciate the sacrifices you're making. Please stick with it. Here's a reminder why, stay home. And this one reads as a friendly note, which shows understanding of how people feel and appreciation for their efforts. So it helps to build rapport um, and, the, and that's partly through, you know, framing the rules as a polite request rather than a warning. And so um, studying these, uh, studying um, the content of, of the corpus from the government accounts, we came up with a list of recommendations for uh, communication on Twitter during the pandemic. So one, to follow plain language principles and avoid using bureaucratic language, to use short sentences in everyday vocabulary, to provide enough detail and ensure the details are correct, to ensure there's only one communicative function per message, to address the audience in a clear way, and to be inclusive of people from different backgrounds. Uh, to avoid posting too many messages which do not provide much information and only link to external content. To develop a strategy for addressing common misconceptions and emerging conspiracy theories. And nine, what we would really like to see is um, for experienced applied linguistics to be involved in the process of designing public communication strategies and analysing their effectiveness. Okay, so that was the, uh, the first of the two case studies that we did. And I'm now going to pass over to Mark, who's going to um, talk about the second case study. I was leading the work package on misinformation, authority and trust. And so obviously one of the things Matt mentioned for, well, early on in his description of, of the project is you know, we're interested in government messaging and um, how Twitter is used as a democratic space as well as a space for public communications from, from the government's public agencies. But it's also being recognised as a place for the spread of misinformation, disinformation, mid-information, so information in emergence, so when there's there's no clear picture of what's true or not yet. Um, and so all these questions about misinformation, authority and trust have been pretty pervasive throughout the pandemic. And because we've got this big body of tweets, 85 million or thereabouts, um, we can ask some really interesting questions and we've got the tools to do so. And you also have access to a tool to ask some of your own questions about potentially some of the ideas or intuitions you might have about the kinds of misinformation spreading on Twitter. So something I was interested in and something that we got a steer from the AHRC to look at was uh, vaccines. So a specific interest in vaccine misinformation because as we know, there's been, um, you can see this little picture here, Bill Gates. Uh, these ideas that vaccines are um, produced by elites in a really short period of time in order to do something like, uh, which is harmful to the general public. And I'll get into some of the, the you know, nitty gritty of the conspiracy theories in a bit. But we had these overarching research questions to look at. So how is misinformation spread on Twitter? So a, a pretty core question about social media in general, really. 
Uh, so how does this information spread? What are the mechanics? Um, how might we use language to, or how might language be used in order to spread misinformation? The second question, what specific topics are the focus of misinformation? So when misinformation is spread, what are the topics? So we know that there's a mass of it. We know that there are different types. Um, or might intuit different types, but what are they? So let's just map them out. And the third question, so what pers uh, persuasive strategies are being used for misinformation? Um, so these are some overarching research questions. That there's, there's some things that we, we have found in our report on, um, as I go through the slides, but um, obviously this is one focus on vaccines. We didn't focus on all different kinds of misinformation going on during the, during the pandemic. So things like uh, masks, our muzzles, and all this kind of stuff that you all have heard of. So what we or what I looked at in this case study was to examine misinformation, political distrust, and vaccine hesitancy. Um, and I'll just read this uh, stuff out here from the, the UK government. Um, so they said that vaccine vaccine hesitancy hesitancy refers to delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccine despite vaccination despite the availability of vaccination services. Vaccine hesitancy is complex and context specific, varying across time, place, and vaccines. It is influenced by factors such as complacency, convenience, and confidence. Um, and, we've, and some of the work that I've done towards this case study was looking at uh, previous pandemics and previous issues of uh, vaccine hesitancy with uh, vaccines such as Zika, um, even measles, mumps, and rubella. So uh, prior to the pandemic, a, a, a increase in distrust of uh, distrust of uh, vaccines related to, to measles. So, uh, increase in rates of measles in um, previously high uptake areas, so Germany, um, Western Europe, the, the UK, and um, and the US. So, vaccine hesitancy presents a potentially uh, significant threat to the UK government strategy for tackling COVID nineteen and providing a route out of lockdown. So not only is it really an issue for um, j just for public health, it's also um, all these issues to do with uh, yeah, being able to congregate together, um, things to do with uh, the economy, things to do with just normal public life or normal-ish public life. Um, this huge, the, the UK's strategy overall for getting out of the pandemic or for tackling it. This vaccine hesitancy stuff is... A really complex social issue. So you, you will have heard throughout the pandemic also about the kinds of communities and the kinds of uh, yeah, the kind of, the kinds of minority populations that are being um, more likely to die from exposure to COVID-19. But also there's issues that lead this, those communities also to be vaccine hesitant or um, there might be vaccine hesitant sentiment circulating within these communities. So i uh, just read out some statistics here. Uh, so the o ONS report on uh, coronavirus and vaccine hesitancy um, identified vaccine hesitancy in around one in six adults aged 16 to 29. So um, younger younger uh, people within, within the population, four in 10, so 44% of black or black British adults um, that being the highest uh, demographic group in terms of ethnicity to be vaccine hesitant, also one of the, the biggest, um, well, one of the most disproportionately represented populations in death of COVID-19. Um, so this is a really, really troubling, troubling um, statistic. Uh, one of the, the worst hit ethnic groups, also one of the most um, vaccine hesitant groups. Around one in six adults of the most deprived areas of England um, are also ha vaccine hesitant. So the 16% of the poorest adults um, uh, yeah, facing these issues or being vaccine hesitant. And one in six parents living with a dependent child. Um, again, the, the, there are issues here with similar vaccine hesitancies around measles, mumps and rubella. Um, so parents deciding not to vaccinate the children are also deciding not to, um, well, well, we can't overlap those populations, but we can probably say that people who are looking after young children, if they're deciding not to get the vaccine, why is that? And these are just some statistics that are here to support that we, we can't make any um, observations on who has tweeted 
or um, circulated certain vaccine hesitancies or vaccine misinformation. But this is a important background um, background information. And finally, this uh, the young adult population are the most uh, uh, most use social media out of uh, the entire population. So we've got this younger people being hesitant, but also being um, one of the, the highest users of social media. And if social media is a significant vector in the spread of medical misinformation and conspiracies related to COVID-19, um, is this a, a, a kind of breeding ground for further misinformation and um, the spread? So you've got these tech savvy youngsters being able to do interesting things with social media and also being vaccine hesitant. So a general view, I mapped this with um, some of the stuff before, uh, we can use track COVID to look at change over time. And we can do this with vaccine. So this is looking at just the term vaccine in the track COVID corpus. And we, we found that it's the third most significant keyword and Matt was talking about keywords before. So we have pandemic, lockdown and vaccine. So these are the three big words in the corpus um, that are statistically significant and um, some way indicative of the language going on in the corpus. So as Matt said, our kind of sampling criteria for the corpus was to look at words COVID, COVID-19, um, coronavirus. So we didn't actually search a vaccine, but it's coming up as one of the most key terms. So when people are talking about COVID-19, they're also talking uh, really quite frequently about vaccine. So it's a key concern from what we're seeing. And so if this is the third most frequent, we also know that vaccine isn't just the only way that people talk about vaccines. They also use terms like vaccine, vaccination, vax, um, and you'll see terms like anti-vax in the converse, but we'll look at that in a second, which gave us about four and a half million tweets. So we including retweets. Um, so yeah, again, even 85 million tweets is a lot of data, even just four and a half million tweets is a lot to deal with and provides us some, um, some data for some interesting insights. What I did was broke those down into looking at different types of tweets, quote tweets, retweets, and separated these into different corpora. And you can see here that tweets themselves, so you've got tweets, um, quote tweets and retweets. So retweets are these things which are repeated tweets. You can see here that tweets themselves mentioning vax vaccine are the biggest population. So these unique tweets, these original tweets, not these things like quote tweets and retweets, which are like additional content. So for retweets, instances of the same retweet, retweeted content were identified and reduced to a single unique retweet. So if you have um, quite a, if you think 65% of all the tweets, so there's four and a half million um, were unique tweets, this 35% is like lots of repetition. So we subsetted that or made them all into one tweet. So it, it made it made less of an impact. And so we had this reduction um, of 44% of the, of the whole data set to look at yeah, two and a half million. So reduce that number from four and a half to two and a half, which, uh, which made things a little bit easier. So we got to look at a little bit of repetition, but also um, mostly focus on uh, original tweets. But what that exercise does is shows that, that, that nearly all, almost half of uh, all talk on Twitter in the UK about COVID-19 vaccines was reshared. So uh, rather than being original comments, they were uh, reshared comments, um, people repeating and retweeting comments about vaccines. So this, this notion that uh, it just brings into question like the, the pervasiveness of the talk about these things. Um, we need to also count in how many times these things are repeated because um, that mechanic, coming back to some of those questions we asked earlier, the mechanics of social media allow for that repetition and that idea of prevalence. Um, so ideas might not be unique, but they can be dispersed and distributed um, much more easily and much more frequently and by far more people. So what we did then was if we had those two and a half million tweets, we could look inside those tweets 
and look at what kinds of hashtags were frequent in those tweets. And so we have tweets including the term vaccine, tweets that include the term vaccine, what, what uh, hashtags that they contain. And we have hashtags like COVID-19, which are frequent in tweets, quote tweets and retweets. So we get COVID-19, COVID vaccine, these words to do with COVID, or hashtags to do with COVID, COVID-19 vaccine, uh, vaccines, COVID vaccination. So you probably guess that these would be frequent anyway. We've got a big corpus of COVID words, a uh, big corpus of tweets containing words to do with COVID. We subset of the vaccine, we're finding hashtags that mark out that topic. Um, we probably guessed that um, before we even get into it. These hashtags, uh, so I'm just going to read off the slide here. These hashtags are not directly related to vaccine misinformation. So we have these quite generic hashtags, COVID vaccine and COVID-19 UK, for example. But in some cases, they are used in tweets containing vaccine misinformation and anti-vaccine sentiments. So we have a, a tweet from the BMJ here and then a quote tweet of the BMJ, uh, which talks about uh, yeah, the Norway is being told to conduct more thorough evaluations of frail elderly patients. And COVID-19 and vaccine, so these two of the most frequent terms in tweets, but also two of the most frequent terms in quote tweets, COVID-19, vaccine, these things which aren't in any way directly related to misinformation are, well, we could probably say they're collocated or they're, they're co-present with some content which is clearly vaccine hesitant or some in some way um, critical of vaccines in general, so genocide of the elderly. So a vaccine is something which is to do with genocide. It's a bad thing. Um, it's designed maybe to, to, to kill people, especially these frail, frail old people. So these are just frequent things. Um, we can't really say that these are misinformation, but this is where we get into the interesting stuff. So where these are the top most frequent ones, we can then look at, well, what I then did was look at the top 200 um, most frequent hashtags in all of these different tweet types and then uh, kind of narrowed that down to a, a fewer uh, hashtags that seem to be much more directly related to COVID misinformation. Um, so we get things like uh, Agenda 21, which is something related to um, well, new, new world order ideas. Uh, we have things like New World Order around here, from the NWO, um, the Great Reset. So these ideas of um, vaccines and lockdown and COVID-19 as being this planned, so this pandemic, this planned idea to, to reset the world and for um, these mysterious global elites to, to do things um, in the shadows and um, change our lives. Yeah, Jeff Bezos, all this kind of stuff, these people who are profiting on. Um, this fake, fake made up pandemic. We found that some of these, which are obviously the, the very frequent, so they're in maybe the top 200 most frequent uh, hashtags in these vaccine tweets. So they're, they're semi-frequent, but they also seem to co-occur. Um, and in total, 17,000 tweets contain one or more of these hashtags. So it's not a, it's not a massive amount, but it's enough to be, um, be interesting. Taking these hashtags, you can, we could, and then uh, if we're just looking at corpse linguistic methods, so we're looking at frequency, and then we can group these things in more qualitative ways into these categories and subcategories, where we have a general, uh, you'll see here the, the total number of tweets, the total number of hashtags per category um, is over here on the right, and you'll see that anti, there's this general anti sentiment towards things like masks, so these. Um, these measures, so the health and safety measures, lockdown, anti-vaccination, vaccine passport, and these are ordered in terms of frequency. Maybe get just general anti-sentiments towards these things, so vaccine passport, for example, the most frequently uh, used hashtags. Conspiracy theories, so general uh, conspiracy theories related to things like uh, human rights, so crimes against humanity as being uh, vaccines are a crime against humanity. COVID-19 and lockdowns are crimes against humanity. These general ideas of related to conspiracies like wake up, things like sheeple, and then this idea of new world order. So this great reset and new world order, which are fairly prototypical base ideas 
that work across almost all conspiracy theories. Like there's some scary other people over there doing something um, terrible that you don't even know about. And we need to uh, reveal the great truth in order to get to those, um, to get to the truth. So a lot of these consp uh, categories overlap. So we see a uh, use of several of these, these categories in the same thing. So we get 5G and Bill Gates and all this kind of stuff working together. And they fuse ideas, evidence, and more prototypical conspiracy theories with COVID-19 specific fears. So we get these outside conspiracy theories, which have existed for quite a long time, being instantiated and realized in their COVID tweets in order to generate and proliferate these new, new forms of misinformation. Um, something I wanted to mention, so I've just inserted these, the really frequent hashtags, so COVID, uh, you can, I've mapped these in a network graph, and you'll see that in the middle, all this messy stuff. Um, the big labels of COVID-19 and COVID vaccine, these are really central to the, this network. Um, but you can see here that there's they, they branch out and there's much more hashtags involved in this um, wider network. But the, the conspiracy hashtags here, so I'm flicking between. Um, in the middle, the COVID-19 central hashtags uh, they link out to these conspiracy specific, specific hashtags, but those conspiracy specific hashtags seem to congregate together in a certain part of the network. So you'll see things like you know, anti vax here, anti vax uh, in the blue, links to things like conspiracy theories, fake news, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so this interlinking between the different, different forms of vaccine for information is really interesting. So we're getting this uh, network, these network block plots. And so with, this, with these hashtags, we can then find some tweets that involve these hashtags and have a look at uh, these sentiments in much more uh, close linguistic detail. So closer linguistic analysis shows that frequent hashtags uh, seem to express negative sentiment towards vaccines. Um, and they're, they're actually most commonly used to deride anti-vaccine stances and point out the harm such beliefs can cause. So rather than being used uh, in a lot of, lot of ways when people say, talk about hashtag anti-vax, for example, it's usually to say anti-vax, like this is a stupid thing, like why would you believe in anti-vax theories? Um, however, so th this idea that when people talk about anti-vax, uh, there's no simple way to find an anti-vaccine tweet. There's no simple way to say, well, these hashtags, because they are, um, they contain terms related to hesitancy, they are vaccine hesitant hashtags. But we do have ones that contain vaccine hesitant opinions. So like this tweet here, you don't have to be anti-vax to not want to take a rushed out vaccine that's skipping the procedure that every other vaccine follows. It's just being pro-safety, especially where a virus with a 99.9% .9 survival rate is concerned, safe vaccines to years to develop. So this is a kind of tweet where um, it's not outright misinformation. It's though it might be expressing something that looks like a legitimate concern, not not spelled very well, and obviously we probably wouldn't find it with if we were looking for vaccines just by itself. Um, but is this a kind of legitimate looking concern? Um, is this outright misinformation? It does obviously look how vaccine hesitant. Um, but how do we tackle stuff like this? How do we understand it? And unlike hashtag pre prefix by anti, those prefix by no, so we get anti-vax, but we also get no vax. The ones with no in, in uh, prefix them seem to be more directly associated with vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. So you'll see these three here. So I don't want it and I will never be ready for this vaccine poison. So this is much more um, directly saying the vaccine is a bad thing. And we have this hashtag no vaccine. Down here we have no vaccine. Again, that real doctors, they are all treating COVID-19 with hydroxychloroquine, uh, um, however you pronounce that, I think this is actually spelled wrong successfully, no vaccine needed. And no vaccine for me, I think it would be safer to catch COVID-19. So these are much more out and out um, vaccine denial. Like, yeah, do not get the vaccine, so no vaccine. A prefix by no is much more anti than things that include anti, um, which involves the contestation. And we get these discourses then. So further sentiments, things to do with vaccines is 
vaccinations being a mass experiment. Nobody knows what else it could, so it, the vaccine could trigger in years to come. It really is one hell of an experiment. So this idea that we're living in a lab or we're some kind of experiment, which works its way into things like guinea pig. So make no mistake, this has been planned. You are the guinea pig. These lunatics need to be stopped using the general public as lab rats. So this thing about being um, a mass experiment and the New World Order and Bill Gates are all responsible for that. Vaccines are toxic. So I would rather clean a whole central line tube cabbage with my tongue than take a COVID vaccine, no vaccine. Uh, dirty vaccines, the COVID vaccine um, news and COVID news is propaganda. The vaccine is the, is the virus. No vaccine for me, more fuel than anyone who gets it. So these ideas of dirtiness, poison, filth, and that turns its way into um, these grand conspiracy theories of things leading to the final solution. So uh, yeah, all, all the roads lead to that kind of um, hyperbolic talk. A few last slides. Matt was talking about this when he was looking at the dashboard. Um, when we look at the content of tweets, we can look at content. The content of tweets that include ha uh, the hashtags related to vaccine and these anti-vax hashtags tend to lead out to these external sites, which are known um, kind of misinformation. Uh, if anybody's really deep into internet culture, uh, things like Gaia and these things, which are a bit, um, I don't know, Parler, uh, Gab, Bitshoot. These are kinds of areas which are breeding grounds for the kind of talk, you know, related to the far right and uh, these far out ideas. Lots of misinformation is spreading on these kind of these kind of sites, and we have specifically fake news websites which which are linked out to. So these are video sites, but we also get these fake news websites like Breitbart, Summit News, Zero Hedge. So these, um, uh, if everybody's brave enough to go and have a look at them in, in your own time. Please do put a yeah, wear your critical glasses while you do. <clears throat> so there, there's some things that we've looked at with the misinformation um, authority and trust case study, but just a note to say that um, if we were trying to use the kinds of methods that we used in this case study to look at vaccine misinformation now and even vaccine misinformation at that time, um, so around about six months ago to look at uh, different social media platforms, maybe Reddit, maybe something like uh, so, uh, tele Telegram, um, Parler, the places where misinformation might spread as well as Twitter. People are wise to it. So people who want to spread this mis misinformation and if you use Instagram or Facebook, you'll have seen all those messages pop up anytime anybody talks about COVID-19. People are who want to spread vaccine information are wise to it. They're coming up with ways to circumvent the kinds of methods that we might use. So searching for hashtag anti-vax, searching for hashtag no vaccine for me. Um, they might come up with ways to get around that. And this is something that was spread in a, a Telegram group related to um, vaccine for misinformation. And rule number one was how to avoid censorship never use active or live searchable text on a post. So don't use words like vaccine or vax, because if you use that, you might get moderated. And if you get moderated, we can't spread vaccine misinformation, or we can't spread the truth and get to the root cause of this new world order trying to um, pump us full of poison. So have no links, but if you do want to add links, always get a tiny URL and make the text unsearchable or unrecognizable. So when you do search out to something like BitChute or something like Parler, don't have parlor.com or don't have bitshoot.net, have a tiny URL, which on its surface doesn't look like a misinformation source. So these people aren't stupid, they know what to do and they know how to spread stuff that they, they want to spread. So some, some final, um, final thoughts and then over to questions. Number one, the majority of tweets about COVID-19 vaccines either do not contain or are critical of vaccine misinformation. I think this is a really important point to remember, um, even though vaccine, vaccine misinformation is bad and there are uh, real social issues and uh, real problems with vaccine hesitancy, uh, vaccine uptake is, is very good. Um, 
vaccine information there's more of it than there should be but just try to keep in mind that the the amount of um tweets containing uh, vaccine misinformation is, is lower than stuff that isn't uh, vaccine misinformation exists within the wide, wider web of misinformation and conspiracy theories where attempts are made to undermine confidence and trust in vaccine health professionals and policy makers so this is true of any kind of misinformation um, often when misinformation or conspiracy theories that exist uh, the same people who are talking about lizard people and people uh, i don't know the, the global elite living at the center of the earth they might congregate with flat earth people and people who believe that um uh, yeah people who believe that vaccines are poison but they might not all believe in the same stuff but there will be overlaps between those communities and we find that the same things happen here the same people talking about new world order uh, new world orders might not be um, they might correlate around uh, not really trusting the vaccine, but one person who believes in the New World Order, um, another person might not, but they're still in the same area. Three, some vaccine misinformation contains language related to known conspiracy theories, but other forms are novel, subtle, evolving, and designed to circumvent automated moderation systems. So this is a real challenge going forward, and this takes us back to Matt's final point in the first case study. Like we need linguists, we need uh, humans dealing with this kind of stuff because if humans are communicating and finding interesting human ways to circumvent moderation systems, we need interesting humans to do stuff about it. For vaccine misinformation is communicated in many forms, so there's no silver bullet to detect it and prevent it. And finally, the ongoing role of the human expert analysts in interpreting these linguistic behaviors is crucial. So I'll end that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll end that with this future plans and welcome any questions because I've already gone over time.